It's been 15 years since 12-year-old Jalik Rainwalker vanished. His disappearance from rural upstate New York was ruled a probable child homicide. But no one has ever been charged, and his body has never been found. This is Rainwalker, the Lost Boy. I'm Jessica Marshall. And I'm Wendy Lepertor. In this podcast from the Times Union, we'll take a deep dive into this mystery, the case of a missing child that has unsettled New York's capital region and beyond for more than a decade. Episode 7, Mount Colfax. Before we begin, a word of caution. The story we are about to tell involves situations that may be very disturbing to some listeners. So please take care as you listen. Previously on Rainwalker, The Lost Boy. Jalik Rainwalker was 12 years old when he vanished, allegedly from his grandfather's house in Greenwich, New York. That was November 1st, 2007. He was reported missing the next morning by his father, Stephen Kerr. Kerr told police his son may have been wearing a yellow fleece jacket, a pair of blue jeans, and black high-top sneakers. Jalik was 5 feet 6 inches tall. Blonde hair, green eyes, biracial. The investigation remains very active and has never been considered a cold case. Several individuals have been thoroughly investigated and eliminated via alibi or polygraph examinations. The status of this case, as of this, of this reading, has been changed from a missing person is now considered a probable child homicide. More than 15 years after he was last seen, the search for Jalik Rainwalker, or his remains, continues. Just, if you see anything, Don't touch it. (laughs) Just stop and call me over, okay? Forensic anthropologist Mercedes Fabian is standing at the mouth of an overgrown trail atop Mount Colfax. We're about 15 minutes due east of Greenwich by car. Like looking for, if even if it's something you're not sure if it's a bone, maybe something's on the surface of uh, the ground or weird changes that you notice like, oh, this is a random patch of nothing in a whole field of grass. Just call me over. Okay? Cool. All right. A random patch of nothing in a whole field of grass, she says? That could be a sign that there's a body buried beneath it. Disturbed vegetation, soil compaction, depressions in the ground, these are all things that investigators typically look for when they're searching for a body. It's a beautiful upstate New York fall day. (laughs) Absolutely gorgeous. Wendy Libertor and I are about to join Mercedes on a search for Jalik Rainwalker's body. We're tagging along with a group of students from the College of St. Rose Cold Case Analysis Center. You have those good pictures. Those satellite pictures aren't good. Oh, you don't have them? No, I do, I do. So, okay. The Cold Case Analysis Center looks at unsolved cases from around New York's capital region like Jalik's. The students dissect the cases. They look for new or unexplored angles and information. Their goal is to provide useful leads to law enforcement to help them solve the case. 
Yeah, like this is the terrain map. Like how that yeah. didn't really help me a lot, but yeah. okay. it does show. Okay. Olivia Valent and Zephaniah Cooper are criminal justice majors. They've been studying Jalik's case. They're both excited and alert going into this search. Well, what are you hoping to get out of today? Um, I mean, hopefully we can see um, if there's any anything in the ground that might um, signify Jalik. But, yeah, um, really. If there's any type of sign that <laughs> Jalik was here or, you know, his remains or anything like that, I mean, that would really be like the gold mine of this. But... I don't know. We'll really just have to see. Right. You know, but okay. if we do find anything, we're going to flag it and get the GPS, and then we'll hand it over to the authorities to deem what they want to do from that. So, so are we going up this way? Who or gets this gate here? That's the Cold Case Analysis Center program director and criminology professor Christina Lane. Um, now, why here? Maybe you could explain, uh, too, why Colfax Mountain is important in the case. Well, the uh, neighbor back then uh, that shares the boundary line uh -huh. with the individual that owns the property that we're looking at, and he contended there was a lot of odd digging activity and burying activity late at night that the property owner did. And he also Christina says the land's former owner was an acquaintance of Jalik's adoptive father, Stephen Kerr, who was the last person to see Jalik before he vanished. The landowner has never been suspected of foul play or charged in connection with Jalik's disappearance. The only person of interest police have named in the case in the last 15 years is Stephen Kerr. But that designation holds no legal weight. Stephen Kerr has never been charged with anything. Colfax Mountain. It's actually Mount Colfax, but everyone we talk to seems to use the names interchangeably. It's not been officially searched by the state police as part of the investigation into Jalik's disappearance. Retired state police investigator Tom Aiken confirmed to us that Colfax had never been searched. Based on the evidence they'd compiled, he says state police did not believe it was high on the list of places Jalik's body could likely be. Cambridge Greenwich Police Sergeant Robert Danko, though, has actually checked out the area. He says he did so at the prompting of several concerned citizens who were worried that the witnessing of late night digging with heavy machinery in a heavily wooded area around the time Jalik disappeared could mean something. Yeah, I actually walked Colfax uh, for on my own just because I heard that rumor as well. And I went up and went, and went and walked around. That area would be hard, but you know, obviously, I was by myself, just doing like a, Is it you know, woods? it's woods, it's uh, gravel bank, you know, like gravel beds and stuff like that, and just you know, some junk up there. But I don't know if that area is on on the radar just yet. I know talking to you know the lead investigators with the state police that you know there were some areas of interest, and but at the time when I was talking to them about it, it was on the back burner because of COVID. So. Colfax Mountain, or Mount Colfax, is almost 1,300 feet high. From 1951 through 1970, the State Department of Environmental Conservation used it as a fire lookout. There's an abandoned fire tower still standing at the top. It's not open to the public. The area we were there to search, however, is across the road from the path to the fire tower. It's now owned by Coldwell Banker Properties. Christina and her students secured permission to be there. What are your observations? Yeah. yeah, I don't know. It looks like it, it could be a possibility. Yeah. You know, I mean, why not? I just can't get over the fact that it would have been 15 years, you know? like. Right. And you could still find signs, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. We'll be right back. If you're enjoying this podcast, take advantage of all the Times Union has to offer and support our efforts to bring in you award-winning journalism by becoming a Times Union member today. Go to timesunion.com slash subscribe. Welcome back to Rainwalker, the Lost Boy. Definitely. 
I mean, this has a lot of good hiding spots. So it'd be hard to find him if he is here, especially after this long. But there are some, some spots. We're on Colfax Mountain, and we're ready to start the search. There's a gate blocking the entrance to the property where we're going to search for Jalik Rainwalker's remains. Once you pass that gate on foot, there appears to be a path that was once driven over regularly, but weeds have taken over. It was more difficult to navigate than a clear and well-trodden trail. I was glad I brought hiking boots. Our feet and our legs were covered in brambles within seconds. And we had zero cell phone reception. Right, let's talk about our, well, let's find our way back. Where the hell yes, are we? I know where we are. <laughs> Um, so, I am not good with directions. Yeah, I, oh God. I, but if there's I, anybody I want to get lost in the woods with, it's you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I am very good in forests because... <laughs> Neither Wendy nor I had ever been on a search for a body before. As we began our search, Mercedes was very patient with our barrage of questions about forensic science. Yep. Is there any kind of, like, forensic equipment that, you know... Because there, there wouldn't be any heat signature, obviously, but something that could, like... You could like scan the area and it could like x-ray the ground. So there's GPR, which is ground penetrating radar. Okay. What that does is it tells you about disturbances in the layers of soil. Mm -hmm. It's a really good tool. The issue is there could be disturbances for other reasons. So if they like went through and dug a hole and put some equipment in there, Mm -hmm. it might pick that up. Uh, Sometimes you can kind of tell the shape of things, but yeah. I mean, there's, there's a possibility it would work. It's just all this would have to be kind of, like, cleared off. Mm-hmm. Um, Anytime we have hunters that use this little route, you know when mm-hmm. they're there pretty much immediately. Aiden O'Hearn lives next to the property. She and her husband moved there just a few years ago. She is not the neighbor who witnessed activity there in 2007. She's a school counselor and a lifelong Cambridge resident. Cambridge is in many ways a sister community to Greenwich. They're about 10 minutes apart and they share a police department. Aiden didn't know Jalik or his family, but she remembers when he disappeared. She walks her dog on the property next door a lot. She's become familiar with it. She was one of the residents who asked Sergeant Danko to take a look at it. There's, um, like, down this way and a little bit to the right, there's a really big cement pit that I think they used to just shoot guns okay. in over to the right. And then back there, there's just stuff, like barrels and all sorts of different things. Okay. Like, way back in, like, just right here to the left, there's things. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, there's just a lot of... A lot of stuff back here. <laughs> As we're walking, we catch a glimpse of a three foot tall plastic Christmas nutcracker lawn decoration. And then a few paces down the trail, another one. They're scattered throughout the wooded area, encircling the property, a leftover from the previous owner. After a bit more walking, we started seeing other leftovers, like Aiden mentioned random piles of industrial looking junk here and there. Discarded plastic barrels, construction metal, wood. There are distinct remains of burn pits and metal burn barrels as well. After about a quarter of a mile, there's a clearing. A wide, sunken pit, maybe half a football field in width and length. Its floor is covered in leaves. Scattered here and there among the leaves? Bones. Mercedes, the forensic anthropologist, doesn't seem surprised. Before any of us could get too excited or squeamish at the sight of skeletal remains, she pronounced them animal bones, probably deer. Hunters have been allowed on the property for years during the state's hunting season. That is part of the foot. Spine? Oh, nope, this is a, a foot, foot. foot bone. So we have um, metacarpals and metatarsals and then phalanges. And this looks like a, it's probably a, a big phalange. From a deer. From a deer. Yeah. Ours aren't, again, the... the She holds up what looks like an arm or a leg bone. It's been picked clean, probably by animals. Uh, Yeah, I was going to say, this one has interesting, like, cut marks on it. But do you see how down here it looks kind of like a weird um, 
a cello almost. Like the yeah, or like cello. a joint kind of a thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Our yeah. joints aren't like that. They don't have like this split in the middle. And um, we just have different landmarks gotcha. on the bone. Okay. Well, what about something like this? That is her. Oh, she's taking the backpack off. This is serious. Uh oh. This is serious. It is. Occasionally, we would get a moment of excitement. Is that a flashlight? I think so. And she's looking into a rusty looking barrel. I wonder what they see in there. Did they say what they saw? It was super deep. Ooh. Oh, it's in the ground. Mm -hmm. Interesting. We spent almost two hours tromping through the woods. In the end, there were two areas that the students and the forensic anthropologist found intriguing. The first was a hulking pile of slate and shale next to the pit. Slate and shale are native geology to the area. Bob Warren even sings about it in his musical. Remember Greenwich the musical? Christina Lane, the Cold Case Analysis Center director, said something like a giant pile of slate and shale could be a pretty good place for someone to hide a body if they needed to. But I'm just, I'm surprised because when I look at that, mm -hmm. there, that hill of slate and shale, I'm like, that would be perfect. You know, because there's a one case that I show the students and it was a, it was a serial killer though. And he took one of his victims and he buried her in a stone wall with those materials, mm -hmm. they didn't find it. They couldn't even see it, yeah. And she was there for a while. Then I look at this. Could, An animal won't be able to dig through that. I was going to say, could dogs sniff something, though, if we brought, like, a dog that was trained? I don't know. I don't know. It just seems so dense. Yeah. Like Mercedes Fabian, the forensic anthropologist, says it's possible, but it would take a great effort to find out for sure. Lots of heavy equipment and patience. I mean, think about how much pressure there is when someone's buried underground. Yeah. All the dirt on top of them. Right, right, right. My guess is he was probably still in clothing. And then if it was placed on top of him, I think there'd still be stuff there, but mm -hmm. you would want to be really careful going through all that. A needle in a haystack or a needle in a slate stack is actually the more accurate. <laughs> yeah. The other area of interest the students keyed in on was a pile of stones further into the woods. We stood with Christina and Mercedes as they looked it over. The weird thing is, is where these rocks come from. Yeah, that's, there's no other. That's not the shale. No, these yeah, rocks this is, are, uh, this part's strange. Yeah. But Mercedes was careful to say, just because there are rocks in a pile that look out of place, doesn't necessarily mean there would be a body beneath them. Um, yeah, what do you think of this? Pop? Anything strange that you've never seen before? Is this run of the mill kind of a? Thing. Honestly, it seems kind of run of the mill um, based on the, the roads. And I just, it would be very chancy to, to get rid of him here. Um, In fact, at the end of our search, Mercedes said she thinks it's unlikely that Jalik's remains would be found on Colfax. It seems too accessible. I mean, there are places I would look, like the stone pile. But I also think there are definitely other places, other properties that should be looked at too. That day, there were no definitive findings for students Zephaniah and Olivia to analyze. But as we trudged out of the woods, they seemed, if nothing else, energized by the experience. Is this encouraging? Like, did this? Kind oh, of definitely. It definitely is. It's nice to, I guess, to get the hands-on experience and see stuff and um, just fill out different places that bodies can be put. I mean, we never know we still could find something when we come back. I feel like us doing these types of searches and stuff like that really makes me hopeful because as long as we keep Jalik's name in people's mouths and awareness about his case, then it won't go too cold, you know what I mean? Right. And I feel like if we keep searching, we're bound to find him. We're bound to find at least something that will lead to him. The experience of searching for a body is almost surreal. On one hand, it's a very scientific process. And on the other, you're looking for a person. In this case, 
a child. A child who was potentially murdered. It was a little hard for me to reconcile. Wendy felt this way, too. We got together after the search to talk through our feelings about where we've ended up with this podcast. So we've spent, I don't know, the better part of a year working on this podcast and the articles that you've written about it. I mean, how are you feeling right now? We've we've done seven episodes. We're closing out the final one. What are your feelings? Well, my feeling is uh, frustration because... Police won't tell us really what they know. We did find some people who gave us a couple more interesting details on the investigation, but Jalik is still missing. No one knows what happened to Jalik. I think that's the frustrating part. We're not able to solve this mystery, and people are still hurting over this and want to know where Jalik is. Do you think the passage of time, like, you know, the 15 years, do you think that's affected memories at all? Totally. This is certainly, it's a circumstantial case if they, you know, for prosecutors. And as long as this is delayed on examining what the police do have, which they have not fully shared with us, the better chance the mystery of Jalik will never be solved. You know, Chief George Bell died during this time. Barbara Reilly's husband died during this time. Other people who were witnesses uh, have died during this 15-year period. And that will likely continue. And the longer this goes, the less likely we're going to be able to uh, say what happened to Jalik, as well as some of the people we talked to who said they weren't sure, they couldn't exactly remember. And uh, it took some digging to try to find out what actually happened because, yes, memories are fading. Anything is possible, and I just do hope that one day we can find out what happened to Julie Graham Walker. Me too. But before we wrap up this podcast, there's one more person we haven't yet met. My story is not relevant. It's a story of how the system could let them adopt him. Pamela Boyd is Jalik's birth mother. She lives in Clearwater, Florida now. You know, at first, Jalik is concerned. The pain I felt when I was not notified. I was notified by the police and the news people. Pamela found out that Jalik was missing when a reporter called her. During the early days of the investigation, she cooperated with police. Chief George Bell says she willingly gave her DNA. And I was saddened, you know, but the sadness wasn't just for Jali. The sadness was because I was I was clean then. So, you know, guilt and stuff ran in. Pamela told us the father of her other sons was trying to get custody of Jalik when Jalik left his fifth foster family. That was just before he was taken in by Stephen Kerr and Jocelyn McDonald. Pamela says her other son's father had had visitation rights with Jalik at the time. But, she says, the custody appeal was denied. You know, so Jalik fell through the crack totally. He fell through the crack and got killed. Pamela is a member of the Justice for Jalik Rainwalker Facebook group. She posts and comments fairly often. She recently posted a photo of a bright red cardinal against a blue sky. It had text on it saying, quote, to the one who watches me from the sky, I will miss you more than you will ever know, unquote. It's been 15 years since Jalik Rainwalker vanished. 15 years is the better part of a generation. For state police investigator Tom Aiken, 
time is becoming an enemy. Because we're so many years out, we already lost George, who knew everything inside and out about this case and would have been such a valuable asset that not only are we all retiring or dying or leaving areas, but the more years you're away from a case, the more you forget about the case. For foster mom Elaine Person, who dropped Jalik off with his father the night he disappeared, she says it sometimes feels like no time has passed at all. The emotion she feels over what happened with Jalik is still very raw. It still hurts. I mean, we spent a year of our lives looking for him and um, trying to find out what happened to him. And that was, that was intense, really intense. And yeah, it still hurts. Time doesn't seem to phase Barbara, really. She says she'll continue to follow the case as she has for the last 15 years, without regret. I, you know, it's, it's I mean, you know, I, I've thought about trying to talk to somebody about, was my decision, decision right? I mean, I could have just been quiet and not searched and let it take its own course and stayed within the home. But, but Jalik is a child. You know, and was a child, and he needed to have have people look for him, just like any child. You know. For Pamela Boyd, the past and future are not relevant when it comes to the child that she lost. All right now, hope is always present. Justice for Jali. If you have information on the disappearance of Jalik Rainwalker, the New York State Police urge you to call 518-692-9332, or you can email tips to nysvicap at troopers.ny.gov. Rain Walker, The Lost Boy, is a Times Union podcast. This series was produced and edited by Wendy Libertor and myself, Jessica Marshall. We had help from Lauren Stanforth, Susan Mahalik, Lori Todd, Erica Smith, Tom Crocker, Jeff Shearer, and Casey Seiler. Special thanks to Dan Higgins. Archival report footage came from local stations Albany's CBS 6, News Channel 13, and News 10, and from Find Our Missing. Our theme song is As You Make the Bed by Amos Noah.